husband is Alex Smith, who is our college pastor, along with our men's, the, over men's ministry, and he does Young Pro, so he does a whole lot of things. And Hannah is such a vital part, I think, of what he does, and she's such a lovely person. I love her. She is my friend. Um, there's never a time I can't go to her, and she's just such a mentor to me and just such a lovely friend to have. Um, she always speaks truth into me, so I'm thankful to have you up here this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to her. And he goes, Mom, I do have eyebrows. <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, you're right. And he was so excited about it. And I tell you that story because I want you to know I'm more excited than Zeke is knowing that he has eyebrows. I'm so excited to be here this morning um, and just to share what the Lord has laid on my heart with all of these passages we read. Um, and as we dive into his word, we're going to look at a couple of different things. But the most important thing for me to for me, is for you to see God clearly. And if you don't, then I have failed at my job today. Um, so Exodus 22 to Leviticus 6 covered a lot of content. <laughs> Exodus is one of my most favorite books. Um, and in these chapters, we looked at the Ten Commandments. We looked at the little commandments that followed after that. We saw the golden calf, the tabernacle being built finished another book of the Bible. So, woo! Three down, 63 more to go. We got it. We can do it. Um, lots, lots going on. Um, but there, in the chapters leading up to the golden calf and the commandments, the passage follows the previous three and then goes right into the third and fourth commandment. And I know that you guys are probably like, well, what does that have to do with the book of Exodus? And I want you to know that it has to do with the book of Exodus. tabernacle right then you had a space where just the priests could go and then you had a space in the tabernacle where God's presence was so this symbolized what God was about to show Moses through telling him about how to build the tabernacle and that becoming a regular part of their customs right so keep that in mind as we move forward um so let's go over it really quick and I actually kind of backed it up to some of Marsha's chapters from the week before because it all feeds into this, all right? So the first point on the timeline is you see that they arrive at Mount Sinai and God calls Moses up. Now Moses goes near God towards the base of the mountain outside the camp. And God states a summary of what had just happened. And it was the renewal of the covenant of Abraham. He had, I just freed you from the Egyptians. You are my people. And he renewed that. Moses goes back down and tells the people God's intentions for them and what God said. And they replied with, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Then Moses goes back up and God says he will speak and the people will hear. He asks them to consecrate themselves and he tells them to not touch the mountain. Goes back down. Moses consecrates the people. God then descends on the mountain and his voice thunders and Moses answers. And God calls Moses up. Moses goes up, not to the top, but to the base of the mountain. And God reminds them to not touch the mountain again. 
and to consecrate themselves. And God also asked for Aaron, but no other priests or people to come up. So Moses goes back down. And while Moses is down, that is when God gives the Ten Commandments. I never realized that Moses was not at the top of Mount Sinai when this happened. He was with the people. And God's voice came from the mountain, and everybody heard the Ten Commandments. This was new information for me. And I went back and checked over and over again. And the people hear it, and their response to hearing God's voice was, you listen and you just tell us what he says. They were too fearful. So then Moses goes up, he leaves camp, goes back, and in Exodus 21 through 23, we see that Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was, and God gave many rules for living. It was a lot of different things. Well, then God calls Moses and the priests up. And this is really the tent of meeting. So they get even closer. It's not the top, but they get even closer. It may even be the same uh, place that chapters 21 and 23 occurred at. But God invites the priests up, and they eat a covenant meal in the presence of God. It was a beautiful picture in those chapters. And God calls Moses from there to come closer. So then Moses goes to the top of Mount Sinai. There he receives the tablet of the Ten Commandments. He was there for 40 days. The whole time he was there, the mountain looked as if it was on fire. And God also gave the specifics of the tabernacle. But before Moses goes back down, God warns him, and this part cracked me up. He said, your people are (laughs) doing something that they should not be. They're building an idol to another God. And it cracked me up that God said that because it just made me think of when my kid's doing something bad and I try to get Alex's attention. I'm like, Alex, your son, you know, your son, you need to take care of him. (laughs) That's what I was picturing God doing, but probably not. But anyways, the Lord warns Moses about what the people are doing at the bottom of the mountain. And Moses intercedes for them without even knowing exactly what's going on by reminding God of the covenant that he made between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses comes down sees the golden calf, throws the tablets, and then we read that 3,000 Israelites died by the Levites. Well, then Moses goes back to the tent of meeting and makes atonement. God forgave, God justified, God sent a plague instead of death, and God tells him to depart for the promised land, but says that he will send an angel instead to go with them because his anger was too great. So Moses goes back to the people, and the people mourn, but they obey God in one thing by removing their ornaments. Moses goes back up, and we see this chapter in chapter 33 that Moses regularly starts going to the presence of God in the tent and meeting. And Moses pleads for God's presence to go with him, and God says yes. And Moses then asks God to see his glory. And it wasn't because of selfish reasons. It was for a sign of the covenant again. So Moses then goes to the top of Mount Sinai. God asked him to cut two new tablets, so Moses brings those. And God revealed his glory to Moses, and Moses stayed another 40 days and 40 nights. It was the covenant renewed. He comes back down, and his face is shining from being in the presence of God. And this continues throughout his life. Whenever he meets with God, his face shines. Um, Moses goes over everything that was commanded by God. The people build the tabernacle exactly as the Lord commanded. We see that as a repeated phrase. And this showed the repentant hearts post the golden calf incident. This proved that they really had repented because they followed God in every small detail in regards to the tabernacle. And then Exodus ends with the Lord descending on the tabernacle to dwell among his people. I loved how Exodus ended. Um, So there was a lot going in and out, and I hope that you can see the overarching story we're looking at today. We're going to focus in on some of the um, golden calf, but we're going to be pulling from this whole timeline, okay? Okay. Um, When I was seeking the Lord on how to best teach this, I felt like he was leading me to look at it from a gospel perspective, and we're going to see what that means, okay? I heard a quote a couple weekends ago at our college conference we took the college students to by a man um, whose name is Coach T, and he said, you don't understand how good God is until you see how messed up you are. You don't understand how good God is until you see how messed up you are. And this quote summed up this story perfectly, right? (laughs) They were eyewitnesses to God's presence, but it wasn't until they saw how messed up they were with the golden calf incident that we really see a heart that is repentant. Um, And it's really a reflection of the gospel. So in order for us to see God clearly, we have to understand our sinful nature and how we are sinners. So let's start there. We're going to start with the bad news first of the gospel. What do we see about ourselves in this story? 
the first thing that we see is that we are unfaithful. We see the Israelites going back and forth on who they want to serve. We saw them going back and forth between serving God, serving the little G gods, serving themselves. We're hungry. Give us something to eat. And we've seen that played out since the beginning of creation in Genesis of how we are a people that are unfaithful to God. Um, It's a battle constantly between trusting him and trusting ourselves. And we like to look for the next best thing that will satisfy I'm an author, but her name is Michelle Meyer, and she said, if we don't make Jesus the only source of our satisfaction, we will constantly be looking for other sources, which leads to constant disappointment. And that's what we see play out here. What, <laughs> yeah, we see the people growing impatient and resort to something that was familiar to them, a golden calf. And it honestly reminded me of Lot's wife. God had just saved them from their enemies from destruction, and they paused, and they looked back to what was familiar in Egypt. They longed for that instead of God's presence, who was right in front of them. Mind you, this was going on while God's presence was clearly seen on the mountain, which just blows my mind. (laughs) It wasn't like it was an out-of-sight, out-of-mind moment. God's presence was right there the whole time. So why do you think that they still did it? I think it's because ultimately they were not familiar with the presence of God. So they resorted back to something that what they were familiar with, which was idols. And you're probably like, Hannah, I'm not out here building idols. I'm not looking to other gods. No, but here's a question I want to pose that I had to ask myself. What other things do you resort to in your life rather than turning to God? What other things do you resort to in your life rather than turning to God? When I answered this question, my answer seemed so silly in comparison to the God of the universe. But it was small things like, oh, I'm having a bad day. I'm going to go treat myself to some food, right? Or social media or busyness or distractions or you name it, shopping. As soon as I asked that question, I'm sure there was one answer that popped into your mind of like, this is kind of my go-to, right? God has to be the source of our contentment in our life because nothing else can stand. And we need to be aware of our unfaithfulness so that we can do daily checks to when our heart is not set on him and when our gaze is not fixed on his. All right, the second thing we see about ourselves. We've seen this repeated, but I'm going to add a tagline to it. We like to take matters into our own hands. We've seen that, right? But the tagline I'm adding is, we like to take matters into our own hands and paste God's name on it. We've seen it from the beginning. But in this story of the golden calf in Exodus 32, 5, we see Aaron do this. He said, here's the calf. Oh, and tomorrow we will dedicate it as a festival unto the Lord. He produced a product, did an action, and then put the label of the Lord on it. And I know y'all know what I'm talking about because I saw some of y'all nodding your heads. I'm talking about making a decision, having a conversation with someone, signing up for another ministry to serve in without discussing it with the Father, without checking to see if it lines up with what he is calling me as an individual to do. And in our own finite wisdom, we see it as the solution to the problem, and we do it asking God to bless it as an afterthought. And a lot of times it comes with good intentions. It's not with bad intentions we're doing it but we are still not pausing long enough to see if God is really calling us to do that. This is where we see, well, instead of seeking God first, we need to pause long enough to see where the Spirit is leading with it, checking to see if what we are saying and doing is lining up with the very Word of God, and in order to know if it lines up, we have to know God's Word, right? We need to be able to distinguish between God's voice, the enemy's voice, and even our voice, and it takes practice to do. And I think this is where we see the starkest contrast between Moses and Aaron. Moses did not move or act without the leading of God. The one time we see him do it, we're going to read about, I think, in Leviticus, the Lord reprimanded him for it, which tells me that real dependence on God is a moment-by-moment thing. Now think about it. Where did we see Aaron before the scene of the golden calf? He was the high priest. So before the golden calf incident, the last time we see him, He is at the feet of God, in God's presence. He had just been an eyewitness to God's feet, and it was a beautiful picture. And then days later, what is he building? A golden calf. (laughs) We need to remember 
that our mountaintop experiences do not carry us through. Aaron had a mountaintop experience with God, but it did not carry him through. Life with the Lord is not just about mountaintop experiences. It is the moment by moment, minute by minute, step in step walk with the Lord. That is true intimacy with the Father. So we get the choice daily, minute by minute. Am I going to align my heart to God's or walk in my own wisdom? We also need to remember to stop looking for the next big thing with the Lord, the next women's event, the next this. We have the opportunity to do it daily. We need to be faithful in the little and small things he puts in front of us. We saw how God was in the tiniest of details when it came to the tabernacle, when it came to the law. So don't you think that means he's in the tiniest of details in our lives too? So we can do this. Because we see that, we know that we can live a life that is surrendered and walk in step with him always. Not moving ahead, not moving too slow, but leaving everything that matters in his hands. Because we know that he's in it anyways. All right, so we have one, we see that we're unfaithful. Two, we like to take matters into our own hands and paste God's name on it. And then three, we see what an ungodly fear looks like. In chapter 20, we see the people so afraid to tell Moses, that that they tell Moses to tell God to talk to him only. They no longer wanted to hear from God directly. They wanted someone else to tell them. And for some of us in this room, this is how we operate or have operated in the past. One, we may rely on someone else to tell us what the Lord says instead of using the gift of God's word and the Holy Spirit to tell us what God says. Or for some of us, we, may, we are dealing with an ongoing sin and instead of approaching God about it, we are fearful like Adam and Eve were and are actively hiding that part of us from him. Or some of us are aware of hurts and grievances that were done against us and we've hid that deep within us and it's because we're scared to let God's light shine on it and this unhealthy fear really keeps us from intimacy with him and what's really at the root of all these fears could it be distrust again for the Israelites they didn't trust that God's timeline and plan was good they didn't trust that he was really for them and even though they were within range of his presence they still had roots of distrust in their hearts and that, they let that speak louder than the voice of God. All of the things that we see in the Israelites and ourselves are not to leave us with a sense of hopelessness. They are things to put on our radar, to fight against, and to surrender to God. They are things that we can bring to the Father and ask him to heal and to strengthen and to guide us. And most importantly, we have the best part of the gospel coming up, right? Who God is. When we see all that God is, it allows us to rest in his goodness and his gift of grace and mercy despite our struggles with these issues. So let's get to the good part. What do we see about God in these chapters? We see it summed up beautifully in Exodus 34, 5 through 7, when God reveals his glory to Moses. The Lord says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. I loved that scene so much. And I feel like you could do a whole sermon just on that one verse because there is so much packed in it. But we're going to focus on just a couple of God's attributes that we see listed and that we see played out in these chapters. The first thing we see in this story is we see God communicate, and it shows his faithfulness. His clarity in communicating shows his faithfulness to his people. In stark contrast to our unfaithfulness as people, we see God's repeated faithfulness to the Israelites. God had already fulfilled his promise to Abraham of bringing the people out of enemy land, and now he is working on fulfilling his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of giving them the land of Canaan. And I don't know if you noticed, but last week, too, when they left Egypt, it said that it was to the day that God promised Abraham. Again, he is in the details. So speaking of details, his, the way he communicates is just beautiful in this passage. If you look up the word faithful um, in the dictionary, the second definition says true to the facts or the original. So... He, we see that play out in the tabernacle commandments and in the Ten Commandments. He is faithful in giving the commands of how to live, how to build, and he even repeated the command, have no other idols before me, four times before the golden calf incident. He was very clear 
and had tried to tell them exactly what he's wanting and gave them opportunities, and they still failed, <laughs> which a lot of us do. Um, but if I were to ask in this room what the most important thing is to have in a relationship, whether it's a friendship, a significant other, your spouse, the most important thing I think would, say, would be is communication. Alex and I do premarital counseling, and there's a whole session just on communication. I feel like we could have three or four sessions on communication, <laughs> and I've seen that play out in my own marriage. The best times in Alex and I's marriage are when we're communicating despite the circumstances, and the worst times are when we are not on the same page and not communicating well. And here God is in this story taking the time and patience to communicate not only once, but then twice after the golden calf, his clear expectations for the relationship with his people. It is not just to list out demands. No, God remains relational in all of this. It is to increase the intimacy with him and to show them how to walk in relationship with him from what they do to work to how they handle business, how they bathe themselves. We'll see more in Leviticus. It was all for their good and for the betterment of the relationship with him. He communicated then. He communicates now. And he is always faithful in this. So the question is, are we training our ear to distinguish his voice? And are we seeking how he is speaking in our lives? Are we on the lookout for how God is communicating to us? The second thing we see about God in these passages is we see God restore, which displays his mercy. We see God's mercy and patience play out in his restoration. If God wasn't merciful or patient, I'm not sure we'd see any restoration in our stories. Because <laughs> like the Israelites, we can be hard-headed sometimes. There were two ways that I really saw God's mercy on display from this timeline. The first way is how he handled the golden calf instance. Tara Lee put it in perspective when she talked about how out of the 600,000-something people, only 3,000 died by the Levites, and that it was implied that these people that died were not repentant in any way. They had the opportunity, and they did not. God is merciful, but he is also just. And then there's remaining Israelites who still did worship the golden calf, but had repented, and so instead of giving them death, God sends a plague. And really, it just shows he, had, he could have ended their lives, but instead he gave them mercy and did a plague instead of death. Merciful and just. The second way I saw God's mercy really excites me. Aaron helped lead the golden calf incident, right? He was the one who asked them to give their gold. He shaped the idol for the people and then put God's name on it like we talked about. God not only spared his life, he restored it. And I'm going to show you how. Aaron's job was to speak for Moses, right, and to point people to God. Then as high priest to consecrate the lamb and to help the people repent of their sins through the temple customs. Years later, one of Aaron's descendants would do the same, but for the final solution of the people's sins. John the Baptist came on the scene declaring, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John baptized the perfect Lamb and prepared the way for Jesus. And John the Baptist came from the line of Aaron. You see it in the genealogy. God was not done with Aaron yet in that incident. He redeemed where Aaron fell and still used him to carry out the gospel. And earlier we talked about how unfaithful we are, how fearful we can be, prideful. And no amount of those can compare to God's faithfulness and mercy in our lives. He has the final say. He has the authority to redeem and to heal the broken parts of our stories, which is such a blessing. All right, the third thing we see about God, which is my absolute favorite part. We see God be present. We see God's presence in the cloud and pillar of fire and how God allowed Moses to be near, how he allowed the priests to see him, and at the end of Exodus, how God finally dwelt among his people. He was after the relationship, not the religion, the entire time. The commandments and rules were not to keep the people away, but to show them how to live with God. That's what his desire was. And they got to do that for a time with the tabernacle and then the temple, but then Jesus came on the scene. So I want you to turn with me to Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. <clears throat> All right, Colossians 1, 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus, Jesus. 
the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the New Testament version of what we see happen to the Israelites in the desert. Jesus had the full presence of God. Verse 19, when it says, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, it is the same language as when God descends on the tabernacle. It reflects the imagery of God filling the temple, too, with his presence. Jesus walked with the presence of God. My footnote in my Bible, it says, Jesus not only bears God's glory, but all that God is also dwells in him. He possesses the wisdom, power, spirit, and glory of God. To say that all this divine fullness dwells in Jesus is to say that he is fully God. So Jesus, full of the presence of God, walked this earth, God's presence on earth again among his people. Jesus, in his perfect life, fulfilled every commandment given to Moses that we read about this last week. Jesus was the spotless, sacrificial lamb, and Jesus was the great high priest taking the sins of the people upon himself. Jesus was the perfect intercessor for his people, and Jesus fulfilled everything we spent this last week reading about. He completed it for his people, for you, and for me. But it doesn't stop there. After he left, God did not leave us without his presence. No, Jesus said something greater than he was coming, and what was it? The Holy Spirit. And how did the Holy Spirit show up on the scene? Through fire. (laughs) And this time, it descended again, and something changed. No longer was God's presence among the people, it was within people, within us. So, do you realize the significance of this? Think back to when the fire descended on the mountain. The people were told not to come near, not to touch, twice, right? God's presence descends at Pentecost, and it touches them, physically rests on them. None of this would have been possible without the work of Jesus. Christ had to perfectly fulfill the requirements we spent the last week reading about so that we can be in God's presence continually. And he did it. And because of what he did, we get to have God dwell within us. I mean, that is some good stuff, right? So what do we do with that? We don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to do what it says. So what do we do in response to everything we read about this past week? I think there are several ways we can respond. The first is valuing the presence of God over being present in the promised land. Valuing the presence of God over being present in the promised land. Um, I read a quote a while ago, and it's it's one of my favorite quotes um, I've ever heard. I have it posted above my kitchen sink, and it says something like this. And it really sums up what Moses grasped in his lifetime. When the promised land becomes less important to you than his presence, you say things like, don't even ask me to go to the land of promise if your presence won't be there. My resume may tell you where I've been, but the best parts of my story is him. Moses really grasped that. It was not about going to the promised land. It was about the presence of God. That was the real gift. So am I treasuring God's presence the same way that Moses did? The second way that we can respond kind of builds off of the first. But let's look at Colossians 1. We're going to, you should already be there, starting in verse 21 through 23. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is the story of the gospel. We were alienated, hostile mind, doing evil deeds, but then we accept the gift of salvation given to us by Jesus. That's step one. If you haven't done that, we need to start there. Step one. But then, after we have accepted, we admit who we are, we admit who God is, how do we continue? It's found in verse 23. 
If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So from understanding who we are, who God is, and what he has done, this is how we apply it. We continue in faith, stable and steadfast, by recognizing the presence of God that is with us, like Moses did. We are able to be stable and steadfast because of God's presence. We cannot do it in our own strength or apart from him. There's other verses about that too. So what we do is we keep our gaze fixed on the truth of the gospel and keep going until the day when we open our eyes from this life and into the next, gazing at the beautiful face of the Father made completely whole in his presence. Such a good time this past week in Exodus. 